I do encourage everyone to move closer, but that's up to you. No pressure. Um, this is this is one of the big um, science case studies, so hopefully everyone is here ready for some uh, big stuff. Uh, I'm very excited about this. I will talk a little bit. Um, oh, I have the remote, and I don't know how to use it. I'm going to talk a little bit about who's on the panel, what kind of presentation you can expect, and then I'm going to get out of the way and let the people who did the real work actually talk. So we do have on the panel uh, Inigo Sangil. Inigo is the project sponsor. He works at the University of New Mexico. Yeah, he's a smart guy. Uh, Dave Reed. Dave is a senior engineer at Lullabot. Dave's going to talk about uh, technical challenges of the project. Um, Sean Busquet. Sean is a senior engineer and team lead at Palantir. Um, Sean's going to talk about agile development process. Uh, I'm Ken Rickard. I'm the director of development and professional services at Palantir.net. Um, and I'm here because when Inigo came to us with this project, I got really, really excited. Um, I think more so than anyone else he talked to, um, because it married the two things that we're really, really, you know, fond of, which is large data sets and helping the world. Um, now that's really, really corny, but it's actually true. Um, and I managed to convince him that we could do this job for him, um, and we've been very, very happy with the results. So that's. Pretty much my whole spiel. I will tell you a little bit about how the presentation is going to go. Again, uh, Inigo is the project sponsor. He's the scientist on the team. Uh, he's going to give you an overview of the goals of the entire project, um, including what we're doing um, in terms of ecological and biological diversity studies. Um, that's really, really good stuff. And it will ground the technical, um, the technical and process parts that go along with it. Um, the basic point, and then Dave Reed's going to talk about the technical stuff and how you solve specific problems in Drupal. And like I said, Sean's going to come in and talk about using Agile as a process. And what I'm hoping you're going to get up from this, um, how many of you are not using Drupal currently? Ooh. Ooh wow. Well, never mind. We're done. <laughs> we're not done. Um, what I'm really hoping you'll get is a sense of how you attack a project of this scale and this scope um, and how we think about as – you know, developers and, and, you know, project managers and all, how do we attack these kinds of projects in Drupal? So, like I said, uh, Inigo's going to set it up. Dave's going to talk about the stuff that made him go, oh, wait, we have to do what? Uh, and then Sean's going to talk about management a little bit. So I'm going to pass it off to Inigo and be back when it's question time. Um, thanks, Ken. That's um, a great setup for the talk. I, uh, you know what is going to happen. I'm honor to be here in DrupalCon. This is almost like a, not almost, this is a dream to be here in front of you explaining the work that we do and embracing the community that, that we came to love many years ago. We started, I'm going to give you, like Ken said, a, a little project overview and especially with some emphasis on the research team goals. Um, after I set up the background, then I'll talk a little bit about how to bring all the project sponsors together and we'll, I'll give a few words about sustainability of the, the development process, and I'll hand it off to, uh, to Dave Reed, uh, which will show you really cool Drupal stuff. Um, so the first thing that I would like to do is tell you what, uh, what we are. We are the LTER, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. It's an international uh, organization that, has, that is in 42 countries. Each country has a network of its own where they monitor ecological uh, processes that go in our planet. And our, the goals of this organization is provide the scientific community and society with the best predictive knowledge about what is going on with our system, ecosystem and the ecosystem services that are in the planet, the biodiversity, the water that you drink, the air that you breathe, the food that you eat is so basic. Um, because I know more about what's going on in the U.S., in the long-term ecological research in the U.S. network, and that's where I work in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I'm going to focus a little bit on to give you an overview of this network. Um, Congress gave money to this initiative about in the 80s, and now we are 26 sites, uh, that is to say 26 places where we conduct long-term ecological monitoring. It spans from Alaska, the north slope of Alaska, to Antarctica, going through the tropics. And there are, as you see, 18,053 scientists associated with this network. 
and we have 34 years worth of data. That's an, a continuous data. That is to say, we, we start recording those data many years ago, and we keep doing so, and we will keep doing so when we are all dead. Now, there are challenges, and many are legacy challenges. One is that each member of this network receives independent funding, so they act as an independent entity. And the biggest challenge is that we have 26 teams, IT teams, spread throughout the country, west coast, east coast, the center, the deserts, the, the, the boreal ecosystems, the Arctic. And yet we are doing very similar things. However, there are differences, and we have been doing and reinventing the stuff that we have done over the years, over since the 80s, before some of you were born. Now, let me walk you through what a single site of these 26 in the U.S. has to handle or has to deal with. Let's go to the north of the slope of Alaska. You drive from Fairbanks about 10 hours. You take a left on the Dalton Highway where the pipeline goes. Go to Tulik Lake. Right there, there is the Arctic LTR that John Hobby set up many years ago. And there are, right now, about 122 persons conducting research. This is a very rustic place. And there are 247 projects. A project might have multiple data sets and a whole infrastructure around it. There are published right now 974 data sets. They are online. You can grab them. Our mandate is to put all this data to the public so you can make, make the best use of them. Um, there are 2,400 parameters in this one site. One parameter might be the air temperature at one meter above the ground. So that is 50 million records since the 80s. Some go back 100 years because before they were LTR sites, they were already collecting data. So now I hope that I give you a scope of the problem and the challenges that we face. Is not that it's large in volume, it's also spread in diversity. We look at many different parameters that are related to the health of our ecosystems, the things that make us live. Let me go and give you a little flavor of some other projects, and then I'm going to walk to the Drupal stuff, which is the, the coolest thing. Now, he, let's go to New Zealand, and then fly due south, and land in a nice round way and then get a helo, a helicopter, and go to the dry valleys. This is in East Antarctica, the McMurdo Dry Valleys. There's a little camp at the base of the Taylor Va uh, of the of the Taylor Glacier in the uh, Taylor Valley and that spills over a perennially ice covered lake called the West Lake Bonnie. And so in collaboration with NASA we deploy an an autonomous robot that can navigate by itself without guidance under the ice in the lake and explore what is in there. This is a prototype to see what kind of stuff go, in, go in, for example, in planets like half-frozen oceans like Neptune or, you know. And so it is a prototype also to examine life in hostile environments. So it's not just the LTR does many more things. And as you can see, it's also, it has the long horn in there from Texas. So I wanted to put this in. Well, we do a bunch of stuff. We just convey, uh, conduct surveys in the in the ocean. We uh, we deploy drones. Here is from the Jornada. We have uh, our information manager from Jornada LTR. Uh, we we study also um, the effects of the humans in the ecosystem. I mean, most of the, the 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 idea of a virgin and last forest is kind of romantic, but it's no longer the mainstream case of our planet. So, but as we want to we want to use in a responsible way the service, the services that these ecosystems provide, and we study that. So, but our team, the team, the team that use Drupal, have a, a slightly different mission, is provide these ecologists and the biologists that study our ecosystems with an efficient and affordable information management system that can withstand the long term, the changes in technologies that can, can survive when we are all gone. So, we need to manage the content, that means manage the content that we need to do. This allow you to discover the data and to make good use of it and serve the information that is distilled from this raw data and the knowledge that that can produce. So that it's not just about data. It is uh, news items, there are blogs. We have a, a K-12 educational program that is outstanding. We have bibliography records that we have to manage, a whole shebang. 
So the first thing that came to mind is how we are going to deal with all this. Is we, uh, did I say that we don't have a lot of resources, that people, you know, we are a non-for-profit, we are based in academia sites, in educational institutions. I probably failed to say that, but uh, we don't have, we are not um, super wealthy in that way. So this is a nice says way uh, about the project. This project had many participating institutions. Most of them are um, universities in the US. So um, in all the icons that you see, all put some sort of support, mostly money, but also time and sweat and tears. And the main sponsor is somewhere over there, the National Science Foundation, but there are many others. There is the UPR in Puerto Rico, the University of New Mexico, the MBL, the Marine Biology Lab up in Woods Hole, and so on. But really, having to all these institutions work together, that is not trivial. That is actually is impossible. It is only happens because there are people behind it. And in this case, you have all this great team. You have Corina Greece, you have uh, my best early adopters, Eda Melendez, who is in the room over here, who believe that we can do this, that even though there were, nobody believed that this can be done, that we can use the same system to manage all this content and go all hand by hand. They supported us, they adopted without blinded. And then we have you know, people in Taiwan, Meiru in Taiwan here, David in, in, uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem. We have Ken, um, we, have, we are based in Albuquerque, so um, the um, guy, I don't have a pointer, but in the lower right, there is a guy with a nice note with a 401 t-shirt. That's, that's the guy who got us into the, in trouble. He is the guy who said, we should be using Drupal. And we were all using different solutions. And he argued why. So why Drupal, really? It's just because it's open source. I mean, yes, in part it is. But there is many dead, dead ends in open source. This is a healthy community in open source that is working, that is passionate, that go out of their way to make things happen. And it has a forum that the first time, ECQ is the first time that you visit it might sound like Chinese to you. But overall, over time, those things and being walked by mentors, all those things will make sense to you. So we thought that this would be a reasonable solution. There is, of course, many other ways. Drupal out of the box might get you 80, 75% out there. Then you need to sweat it and make it closer. And if you harness the, you convince your group that this is a viable solution, then you can go ahead and get the best people in the industry and help you to get and nail the details that are so necessary. So this is where, where our great, um, people here in, in, the, in the table with me come into place. There are many, of course, many other reasons why we adopted uh, Drupal. And I'm not gonna go into details because it's just intense. It's, it's, we, it is a humongous project, it's life. We are still developing, we are going forward. So let me talk a little bit about sustainability of the project. We started this in 2009. Drupal 6, it was beautiful, it was great, but we didn't know much about how to best position the project so it would be easily maintainable and, and not a mess. So this is one of the things that we learned from this great group and uh, we just put ourselves in GitHub, learn about the workflows. We use Drupal, who itself is a very sustainable system, a future looking system and of course contributions of people like you. We use about 80 contrib modules. All the code that we developed is out there. We are transparent, we give back to the community. Every patch that Dave came up with, whether core or for a contrib module, was posted and we are happy to give back because we received so much from your community. So this is from, well, my community too. So this is what we do. I will encourage you to contribute. You know, Even if it is a one commit a day, that goes a long way. Even if it is less than that, one commit a week, or just an issue, a test case, a sprint, that's something that will keep us all going together in, in moving forward our project. Our long-term goals will be many. I have short-term, mid-terms, and long-term goals, but basically we keep continuing helping the researchers, the people who can provide the predictive knowledge about the health of our ecosystems. But we can also, we want to add users and um, developers and if you cannot um, 
donate your time or your expertise into helping us uh, grinding some of the issues that we have, and, but you know somebody who has funds to advance this project, please come talk to us because we really need, and this is a, a very exciting initiative, it's fun, and it will is really helpful for, for all of us. So without that, I'm going to give it to Dave. Dave, uh, as you know, is from a different planet, but uh, this is the diversity of Drupal allows us to embrace people like that. And he has done uh, marvelous things with, with all of us. And um, I'm forever grateful for, for all the help and, and the, the many times I have gone out of the way to accommodate the, the needs of the project for, for us. So thank you for that. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Nigo. Um, so I, I'm, you know, right in the weeds with Drupal. I'm a Drupal developer. That's It's what I love to do. Uh, and this was a really interesting project. Uh, we went to an on-site in Albuquerque and had a great time um, eating all sorts of, you know, chilies and all kind of good stuff. Um, and had a really good chance to to be a part of their team and just kind of learn and absorb. And like I saw a lot of a lot of challenges. I, I give them a lot of respect for uh, the Drupal six install profile they had already made. Um, but as I as I saw their team and uh, Kristen, one of their information managers, uh, who's like a, a content editor essentially a role, um, work through uh, the site and like what she usually does during the day, um, I saw just several opportunities for like oh maybe we could improve that. Maybe we could help make the, that better uh, and make this. Like I always like come into a project thinking like I want this to be a joy for this client to use. Like I want them to be happy when they're using this after we leave. Um, and so I, I hope that they, they that's true. Um, but so I kind of wanted to walk through some of the the problems that I saw uh, and we recognized as a team and kind of talk a little bit more about how how we approached them, how what we used uh, in a more specific way in Drupal. Um, so one of the first things I saw is that there's lots of, I mean, it's it's a scientific project. There's lots of interconnected data, um, and they were a lot of doing a lot of data entry. Uh, I think there's like there's a data set content type, and then there's a data source content type, and then there's a variable content type, and then there's people as a content type, and there's like all these four different things that would have to come together uh, into essentially to represent one complete data set. Uh, and they would have to enter it in four different forms and then like back reference them, uh, remember what the title that they use, that kind of stuff. And it just it felt like it was a suboptimal process. And one of the great things about Drupal 7 uh, is that there's, there's a great module called the inline entity form um, that if you use uh, user reference modules to kind of relate things together, uh, rather than having to, you know, type the name of something, uh, you get more of a UI like this, where, like, you get to be able to do it right in line, uh, where you can add something or refer to something existing right from the same form. Uh, and it actually goes really, uh, it goes interesting. Like, uh, I'll show a little quick uh, animated version here. I think it's animating. Yeah, I can't just see it on the preview. Um, but, like, you can go through and edit a person or the data source just right there. Um, and you can add new ones, and it's just, it's a really, it slows things down just a little bit, I will admit, but I think the benefit of having all this from administering right on the same page and not having to go back and jump around, it's really helpful, I believe. Um, so that's the inline entity form. That's a really great module to use. All right. So, yeah. Um, another really interesting challenge that we had, uh, I talk about this variable content type. Um, and I'll kind of show, it was kind of complex and it took me a little while to wrap my head around like all the parts of it and everything. Like I'm not, I'm not a scientist by, by default, you know, I work with Drupal. Um, so, but eventually we got a hang of it. Um, and I, and I was kind of studying this process and kind of evaluating what we should do in Drupal 7. Um, and so I kind of wanted to show what the form uh, looked like in Drupal 6. Um, so we had a variable form, and it had one tab with like a name, label, all the basic information, maybe like a description or definition of, the, of that variable, um, and what you considered missing values. This corresponds to like actual uh, column of, of data in, in some kind of collection. 
Um, so there's like this first tab, there is a second tab. If it was a physical quantity, like uh, something that's actually measured, uh, you would fill this part out with like the unit, minimum, maximum, uh, precision, all that kind of stuff. Um, but if it was a date, you didn't want to fill this out, you wanted to fill out the next part uh, with like the format of the date. Uh, or if it was a, a code, like a, a key value kind of thing that corresponds um, with an associative fashion, you'd list out the codes. Um, like you type in the key and then a pipe and then what it corresponded to is like the label. Um, so like I felt like we could do better here too. And we evaluated a lot of solutions. Like we could have made a content type uh, with fields but kind of put them all in the same form. Uh, you know, we could have done like inline entity form possibly or made our own custom entity type. Um, but actually, we made our own custom field type. That seemed to make the most sense. Um, so we made a, a deems variable uh, field type. So anytime you have like this complex interaction or user interface, um, you know, if you have a developer on hand, don't be afraid to make a custom field because this, I think, really helps streamline things. So I would really like to show how this works. Um, so we have this uh, the variable type and it's all on one screen now. So you've got you know, your name, label, definition. You can type in a code list. You can pick what type of variable it is, and it will Ajax populate like all the stuff you need to fill out based on that type. Um, and it's just, uh, I found it really, I mean, from a developer, I found it easier to use. And I hope Inigo would agree that it's, it's much easier to use as well. And I, like, I put a little summary thing up above so like you could collapse it and hide that information if you needed to which is kind of important when you're working with a lot of data as well um, so yeah we found that that very useful and that worked really well um, so don't be afraid to find something custom this was this fit that use case where nothing really worked out of the box so we we really enjoyed using this and it was it was fun to develop too it was a fun challenge uh, another fun problem is reusing data. Um, so, for instance, you've got a, a, a set of data that you're collecting, and you collect it for 2005, and then you want to make a new data set, but for 2006, um, and record it down. You're essentially reusing the same stuff, but you maybe just want to tweak some stuff or add in, put in some new data that was submitted, uh, but you want to use all the same kind of metadata about it. Um, so what we did is using the inline entity form module, um, there was kind of a patch that was languishing in the issue queue to add a clone button. Um, and we revamped that up and got it ready to go. And so that was that works really well. So that's just, you can hit clone and it clones that data source. And then you can edit it with the inline entity form module. And, and it works really great out of the box. Um, another thing that we developed uh, with, those, with the variable field type uh, was how do we allow people to easily reuse variables they've already entered before? Because, you know, again, say you're entering something very similar, you want to kind of reuse a variable you'd already used. Rather than trying to go back and refer to it, it's now a field type, so we can't really do it. It's not an entity. Um, so we did something really kind of cool and interesting. Um, our new field type, the, the deems variable field type, we actually integrated it with the core search module. So anytime that you filled out a, a data source that had variables, we shoved those variables into search um, so that you could search by keyword on them. And so we actually have this like search field inside our variable widget so that I believe if I have a, an animated version, if you typed in, you can easily search and it shows you like a little summary. And if you click it, it automatically populates all the fields that you had used um, based on what you selected. And that way it's just an easy way to reuse what you'd already done. Uh, and it was just, I don't know, it just, it, it worked out of the box with search. So. Okay. All right. Uh, another interesting challenge was, I mean, Inigo talked about having large amounts of data as well. Um, and they were not lying. Like these, these files that were coming in from the field were gigabytes or larger. Um, and if you try, have ever tried to use a Drupal upload field with 
a large, large file like that, it tends to not go well. Um, so it was kind of a, just a, a small challenge here to figure out how we could best handle that. Like we could, you know, have them upload it separately. Okay, let's go with that. Um, but then how do we refer to it in like the Drupal UI? How do we pick it? And there's this great module called File Field Sources um, that kind of has some options like I want to refer to a file that's a remote file or I want to use a file that's already uploaded somewhere. And But out of the box with File Field Sources, if you use this like option for I want to pick a file that's already been uploaded, it would still try to move the file to your files directory with a large file that does not work well again. Um, so we actually contributed a patch back to file field sources um, that if this directory you could pick from was already in your Drupal files directory, it just left it alone. It just said, here's all the files that are there. And so they could just be feel free to upload straight to their Drupal files directory and pick a file right from there. Um, and that worked really well. And we also integrate with the, the chosen um, user interface library for select fields. So if this list was really long, uh, they would actually see like an autocomplete and they could type in the file name and be able to find it without having to scroll through the entire list. Um, so that was really nice. And I'd probably say the biggest challenge for this project um, was how to represent and display this data. So there's obviously like the HTML version of showing all this data off. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a scientific project. We, they don't always share things in HTML. Um, and there's actually uh, this format called EML, or Ecological Markup Language. Am I saying that correct? Yes. Um, that they would display all these data sets in. It's essentially uh, XML, uh, but a subset of XML with uh, added fields, that kind of stuff. Um, and we essentially need to represent the same stuff, you know, in EML. And the problem is we have all these four different content types. Yes, we're doing a better job in the UI of connecting them, showing them all, the, all on the same page, but now we've got to actually display them as essentially XML data. Um, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to tackle that? And in Drupal 7, there's a new terminology called view modes. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of view modes before. A few. Okay, good. Um, so view mode is like just a name like a teaser or full, uh, like full page. It's just a kind of a, a way to build a standard set of how to display an item, like a node. So like how your node displays when it's viewed as a teaser. And that's the teaser view mode. Um, and there's actually an RSS view mode in Drupal core out of the box. And so we made an EML view mode uh, and an, out of this EML module and basically kind of centered everything around that. Uh, and we made uh, specialized formatters, so field formatters for all of our data to output what chunk of XML that would need to do. So like our, our variable field type, would we had a formatter for that that would output it how we needed to have it in the, in the EML. Um, and we connected all together with templates. So I'll kind of show just a little bit about that. It's gonna get some code, don't be okay, it'll be okay. Um, it starts out in our EML module with uh, EML entity view. So this is the, the standard Drupal 7 hook that gets called anytime an entity, you know, node, user, et cetera, is rendered. Um, and it gets a view mode parameter there, as you see. And so we say, you know, if, it, if we're going through the view mode that matches EML, um, we are setting a special theme key. So rather than using like the node template, um, we're kind of overriding it. Say, let's use the EML template, um, which is actually works out pretty well. Like core lets you do this. Um, so we had a base eml.tpl.php, and then we had a, an EML that corresponded to a, a data set. So this is our like EML dash dash uh, node data set dot tpl dot php and you know it's recognizable as xml but we're doing kind of the standard things that drupal does in templates which is render fields uh, we have some hard-coded things but not too many um, and an interesting thing like uh, down this last line here uh, the field data sources 
So we're rendering the data set, and then once we call this render field data sources, we're going to then render uh, the associated data sources within this data set. So it's, we're starting to nest down and render and continue down to all those associated things. Um, and it's really nice because our format would say, well, render the data sources using the EML view mode, and it does the same thing. Um, so it's just, it's, it's a much more flexible way of controlling this output. And I really have to say I was impressed with Inigo and his team because they kind of took this framework for rendering, you know, these data sets using uh, the EML module, and they've actually duplicated it, and they're now rendering it in another format. And they're kind of set up in a better way um, and to be able to pivot or shift uh, in case a new format comes up uh, or they need to, some government sponsorship or contract requires you to be in a, in a standardized format. They can easily do that. Um, so I think this has set them up uh, for success and, and, and long-term success, and, which is appropriate since it's a long-term e ecological research project. So, um, Another fun thing was some of the long-term stations had set up like a data explorer where you could actually go in and like actually view the raw data. Like you could say, show me all the records from this data set from 2005 to 2010. And you could see it in the browser or you could download it as a CSV file. Um, but this one station had done this feature and we're like, maybe this is something cool we can have for everyone. That sounds like kind of like a, a thing people would find useful. Um, and we discussed with, with Nigo and his team, and they agreed. And uh, so we kind of, uh, it was interesting because this independent station had basically copied all their data into a separate database, which was then used to display all this data on their website, not in the Drupal database, but a separate one. Um, so we kind of abstracted that functionality out into a schema reference field um, so it's just a nice little field that lets you refer to a specific database and then a specific table, um, assuming you have it set up in your settings.php uh, listed as an official database to Drupal. Um, so if for some reason they have made this data set in an, available in a database, they can refer to it. And then we did a whole module with like making all of it explorable using the variables uh, and kind of connecting it all together. But the schema reference field made it possible. So that's kind of an interesting one uh, if you need to refer to external stuff. Uh, another great challenge was this was a Drupal 6 install profile. And all these sites that had it installed were working on Drupal 6, but we were working on the Drupal 7 version. How do we get all these sites to Drupal 7? Because the reality is it's an install profile, so everyone's kind of tweaked or changed the way that they've done things, maybe added some content types, removed some fields. You know, there's no real enforcement for what they can do. Um, so they, it's kind of the wild west of install profiles. So it's this challenge of how do we migrate all these sites and, and handle that? Well, our first step was to basically identify all the stuff that was in the base install profile. We wrote a migration for that. That's kind of our base migration. Um, so all the content types that are supported out of the box, uh, we wrote, uh, we use the migrate module, which is this kind of a, a sample of what you would see as a migration. So this, this migrates uh, uh, people in, in a content type from a Drupal 6 database. Uh, but you don't really have to understand this, it's okay. Um, but that's our base migration. So we started with that, we had it written. Um, and so yeah, we got our, all of our content and common stuff done. And then we actually added a, a hook, a hook alter, uh, very appropriate for Drupal. It's what we do in Drupal 7 um, that says, hey, we've got our base migration. Here's all the classes and what they all refer to. You know, I'm going to run this alter hook. Does anyone want to change it? And this is actually really, really useful for all those individual sites because they can say, oh, hey, that person content migration I actually have to tweak a couple of fields. I'm going to override that class, and I'm going to do what I need to do, but still have the support of that base class. Um, so, for example, um, Sevieta is a is one of the research sites, and they extended the person migration. And you can kind of see with like remove field mapping and say, nope, we don't have field user account. 
We don't actually have that on our site. We deleted it. Um, but we do have a, uh, a field user account that should come from this data. Um, and they're just able to override it very easily. Um, they don't have to, you know, copy the entire migration class. They can just do what they need to change. And it just kind of works out of the box. And it works for their site. Um, so if you ever have a, a large multi-site install or, you know, an installation profile like this, um, Migrate is a great tool. And I would encourage you to, like, add some support for being able to alter it like this. And just we also did some, uh, some fun things with it being an install profile. Um, you know, with the setup process, it's, it's a nice, Drupal can allow you to add uh, forms to the actual installer. Um, so we actually added some steps like, oh, hey, you want to do some EML configuration for some of the, like, things that are put in every EML output. So, like, what's your station acronym? Um, you know, each of them have a package ID to kind of identify that data set. Um, and we allowed them to fill this out on install. Um, and we also packaged everything up using features as well. And one of the nice things we kind of did was in the installer, uh, we added a step for, hey, here's all the optional stuff that you could enable. Do you want to enable any of these before you install the site? Um, or they could do it later, too. So, like, we have the, the data explorer I talked about, uh, our Drupal 6 migration, uh, our field, variable field search. They could all enable these right here. Um, so that was uh, a, a fun way, like, to enhance it. So for anyone new to this install profile, it, it would be, I think it would be helpful. And, of course, as Nico mentioned, it's all, uh, we're all developing this on GitHub. So it's open source. Anyone can contribute. I can, I can still contribute to it, uh, and I have occasionally. So... I would encourage anyone to check it out. We also then mirror it to Drupal.org to get packaged as an install profile. Um, but GitHub works a little bit nicer for development. So, yeah, that was a really fun process. Like, uh, I don't know, this, this is iterative process of being finding these problems, how can we figure them out, uh, that kind of stuff. It, was, it really works well, um, you know, with our team. It was really great to have the on-site and kind of see what their team is doing. And I think by the end of the project, I considered myself a Drupal scientist. So <laughs> it was great. Um, but to kind of talk about that, that process that our team had, uh, I'm going to invite Sean up to talk about that. OK, great. So people who came in a uh, little later after Ken introduced us, as Dave said, my name is Sean, Sean Bousquet. I work with Palantir.net as one of the uh, senior engineers and uh, team leads. And Dave and I were, we had the opportunity to work together and, uh, along with one of our other in-house developers, a lot of also side consultants within uh, Palantir to be able to help teams. And um, we also got to go, go and visit them. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the process. Uh, Dave talked a lot about how he used uh, different pieces of Drupal or technology or programming to be able to solve very practical issues of making data easier to enter, those kinds of things. Uh, before I start actually talking about the agile process which we use, I will brag on what Dave architected. A lot of what he's shown you may be specific to Deems, but honestly this is really a data set manager with variables that you guys can add, control, or change. So whatever your field may be, if you're collecting data and data sets or managing them, uh, that kind of thing, Deems is a profile to start with. And to even look at maybe some best practices, um, really also, though, the way that he architected it with what is the output, the output is extremely themable. So yeah, if you don't use environmental markup language, you have something else for your, your own sites, your system, whatever you're doing, it could be easily extended or changed. Package it in features the way that he did. Um, really, it's a way that you can choose what you need and or replace uh, what uh, you need specifically for your site. And as he said, it's up on GitHub, and we hope that you will take a look at it. Um, so let's see. This is the Agile process, current slide. Um, so as uh, Dave kind of uh, you know said, there was process to this as well. And really, when you look at... Um, how, why do we use Agile? It helped us solve some, some particular problems with all the number of constituents that we had, as Indigo talked about. A lot of universities, 2,000 scientists all over the world, 26 sites. How did we solve some problems? Uh, would that come up with that kind of thing? I'm going to cover the Agile process that we used. I'll highlight a few points along the way in the process. 
maybe give an anecdote or two, and then uh, we can have some deeper questions later. So, uh, so those of you who may or may not be familiar with the Agile software development process, I'm going to read a quick definition for us. Um, you can definitely find out more. Just Google Agile. You'll, you'll be able to find a lot of good material. Um, I'm going to provide this definition so we all have a similar understanding because sometimes Agile may mean something different to different people. Um, what it was for us is it's an iterative and incremental uh, development approach where the requirements and the solutions evolve through collaboration, and that was a big part of this project was the collaboration between self-organized and cross-functional teams, and there was definitely a lot of cross-functional teams that worked together to be able to pr produce this. Um, as an agency at Palantir, but also for this particular project, Agile helps us meet certain goals or provide certain benefits to us, um, including speed, flexibility where we're able to pivot or, and or be able to add on to things later as uh, new priorities come up, that kind of thing. Responsibility, um, we found uh, both on this project and others, the right people have the right responsibilities um, and have the, can make the decisions when we need to and the developers take personal responsibility for a lot of pieces of the project. And creativity. Um, iterations allowed us to try things and not be so afraid. Um, you know, we could try things early on in the project at a time where the risk was less. And uh, we had, in fact, it, you know, I'm going to give some anecdotes here, is one of them was there was a particular feature that Inigo was really interested in taking a look at, but we weren't sure how much level of effort it was going to take and how long. So the Agile process allowed us to actually explore that feature in one of our sprints, which is one of the iterative processes that Agile uh, helps you with. Each of those circles that I showed you earlier is like a two-week sprint. And uh, in the first two-week sprint of the – when the idea came up for using this, uh, Inigo said, go ahead and research it. If it's going to take longer than X number of hours, which for us turned into level of effort or what are called story points, if it's going to take longer than that, then we don't want it. Well – it was we were able to explore it, try it, roll it out because it was actually going to take quite a bit longer. Uh, however, there were a lot of other features that we got to be able to explore and say, yeah, this is worth uh, coming in. So the Agile process allowed us with a lot of creativity as well. Biggest benefit that um, for our company, why we switched over to Agile and why we brought it to this project is we want to deliver the right value at the right time. Um, what Agile does is it's not unplanning because there is a plan in place, but it is flexible enough and allows both our clients and our developers and the whole project to be ready to be able to focus on a new priority in the next iteration or series of iterations if we need to. And there were times that that occurred on this project. Um, if there was a key demo that was coming up, uh, you know, Inigo might point that out to us and say, you know, I'd really like to show this section to people. I know that the backlog, which was their order of priorities or things, say the next sprint is going to be about this, but can we move it around? Well, sure, because what it, the, our process or the Agile process allows you to do is to be able to, to work on what's providing the most benefit at that time. Um, we're not switching in between sprints. Um, you know, a sprint is kind of frozen. Therefore, you don't have to worry your developers, you know, suddenly having to move from day to day um, what priority was. But in a very managed, um, agile process way, in the next sprint, we always readdress priorities, re readdress what is the um, order of the sprint log, which I'm going to show you a little bit in a second, to be able to uh, determine as a team what's the best value for our product at this time. So, and there's a lot we can say about that. I mean... It's a, it's a very good thing in terms of helping to drive your project and provide value. Uh, one of the things I do want to call out, and like I said, I'm highlighting different parts of, for this particular project, how did Agile help us? And in this case, Agile helped us by, one, defining a product owner, but what made it work and what really makes it work with our clients when we can get this kind of uh, activity is our product owner, which was Inigo, was very present during the entire process. And that's sometimes hard to get, but if that's what made this project an extreme success is, um, you know, he would be in uh, different places in the world. I think you were in Alaska one time, and he would show up on our stand-ups, uh, that kind of thing, and um, providing that feedback on a regular basis, being aware of what was going on with the project, um, helping us, us to sort out just anything that we needed. He was there for us. Um, and that really helped also. Um, you know, well, there were a lot of voices during this project. You know, Etta, you gave us some good 
um, you know, feedback we talked with a lot of people um, throughout the network and who were users of this. Um, and some people asked for various things, and, and Inigo helped coordinate with the stakeholders um, and explain to them, well, here are the priorities right now. Here's what we're working on. Yes, we'll try to get it in, that kind of thing. And he just he served to help keep those constituents happy um, as well as sort of keep the amount of noise we were hearing as developers um, to what we needed to be focusing on on that time. Um, so that was just a great benefit is – uh, if you do the agile process, which maybe you know, hopefully some of you do, um, encouraging that product owner to become that very strong, uh, very present person was was very great. Okay, um, as part of our agile process, we have uh, at least on a few projects, and we're starting to practice it more and more. What we're calling Sprint Zero. Um, what this allowed us to do is Sprint Zero was before we actually went on site, we received a lot of information um, in prep for going to the on-site in New Mexico and, and meeting the uh, DEEMS team and the leader team. Honestly, there was a lot to wrap our head, I mean, around, our heads around to be able to understand not just, I mean, it was hard to understand what they did. Um, the scope of what they did was just absolutely amazing. And then the technical aspects um, of the, really the details of their data, kinds of things they needed to do. And having the time, we, we took about two weeks, maybe it was uh, four weeks total, but um, we had a, well, we, we had a, an official two-week sprint zero. Um, and that, absorbing that information prepared us for going on to the on-site. And we didn't, we still hadn't known or gleaned everything we could for the project, but what it did allow us to do is a lot of times when you go on-site, a lot of it's just information feed and spooning. Um, you know, giving you that that stuff. I felt like when we came um, to uh, New Mexico as a team, we were at least ready to go. We understood some of their domain language, you know, their, their custom information. Uh, so we were ready to be able to talk as a team and do that. And having that Sprint Zero allowed us to do that. So I encourage others to try that or to build that into your process, especially when there's um, a large amount of information. And also I think Sprint Zero's point out that Agile's not about not doing discovery. You know, Agile is definitely about doing a discovery. Uh, we did it in iterations. So it was knowledge acquisition as a typical ticket in, a, um, in an Agile process. And then we did an on-site intensive, um, almost like required for a project like this. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we can do a lot of things through Google Hangouts, that kind of stuff. Uh, but going and meeting the team, um, having the team present the entire time. I think we were there, what, three days? Yep. Yeah, three days. It was intense. Um, but Anigo had grabbed um, a lot of the stakeholders, brought them into the same room. Uh, we conducted agile training for them. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've had clients or even uh, yourselves, if you've looked at the agile process, it feels like there's a lot of information. But actually, once you get into it, suddenly clients begin to adapt it and speak in, you know, speak in that language and that kind of thing. And it really helped us because we conducted the Agile training, and it gave us all a common language to be able to speak in, um, you know, particularly with there's a part of Agile process called user stories. And um, that just creates, like, benefit statements from various potential types of users who are going to use the site. And um, we began communicating through user stories the day one of the process. And, and one kind of funny anecdote for it is, um, we passed out index cards. So we did use flat, straight index cards, which, by the way, again, side note in terms of experience, uh, you know, having the actual index cards and writing them down was more beneficial and it kind of like the communication flowed quicker rather than having to sort of stop and have someone enter it into the computer and the computer. It was a big pain afterwards where we had something like 300 user stories to enter in after the on-site, but it made the on-site a lot more flexible um, by just doing it old school and putting it on uh, index cards. Uh, we also had the team um, carry around index cards during the entire uh, on-site, uh, so they had them in their pockets, so that if they took a break or if they were back at their desk for a while, if we were out at the bar having a few beers, uh, we wrote several user stories um, at the bar. Um, it encouraged basically that we're thinking about the project the entire time, and if something came up, they had a quick place to be able to capture that idea. And I'll tell you, a lot of good user stories came out of those um, more ad hoc times. Um, not only did having this Agile process and using user stories and conducting the, the Agile training give us a common language, 
Um, but it helped us also. We began to use the client's domain language itself. Um, we learned what they – we learned to speak their language a little bit, and they wrote those in their user stories. And uh, we were able to translate it into the technical side. Ken, how are we doing on time? Five minutes? Okay, great. Uh, and the biggest – the reason for the success um, – on the on-site was a lot of the stakeholders were there and present as well. So um, as I kind of mentioned before, we had the user stories, uh, kept cards there for the entire time. Um, and also we were kind of, we had great hospitality and um, great coffee uh, during the time and uh, that helped us for the success. So I'm gonna kind of quickly cover um, the ideal agile uh, two week sprint. And this is really what we did use on the project as well is um, we, Starting on Mondays, we had the backlog in order. And if you're familiar with Agile, and again, I encourage you to go take a look at it if you're not, having the backlog in order before you start on that Monday, having the client already or the product owner already prioritize the, um, the needs, you know, for prior to that week and kind of it stays in order. As developers coming in that week, we were able to choose new user stories to be able to discuss what can we get done this two weeks according to what the, the client had already said in terms of priority. Um, we'd have a pre-kickoff where we met as developers first without the client present. Um, and you can do this anyway. You can mix it up. Our pre-kickoffs, though, were really a place for the developers to come together and do a little negotiating of, you know, you think we can get this 16-pointer done or can we move this out and do something else, et cetera. After that uh, pre-kickoff, we would do um, an actual kickoff meeting um, with the team and with the product owner, with a couple of key stakeholders, although the product owner was the primary speaker for it. And we would say, hey, this is what, according to your backlog, this is what we think we can get this done, uh, get done this week. Does this still meet with what you're interested in? Um, and they would confirm or deny a lot of times. They would say, oh, I just got a phone call from Puerto Rico and there's a new priority, uh, that kind of thing. So we might adjust it a little bit. We also maybe use it as a time to get final pieces of information before we froze the sprint log on uh, the next day. So um, should I stop here and let some time for, for uh, questions? So uh, basically, we use the general Agile process. Because we are running tight on time and we want to give you guys an opportunity to an uh, ask any questions, um, we're going to stop here and Ken will moderate um, a couple of questions for us and we'll use up the last it's like three minutes we have for, for questions. So, again, thanks. Um, these slides will be um, online, you know, after this. So uh, you'll be able to get the rest of my presentation, you know, with that. So, no, anyway, I hope you enjoyed. And remember, Deems is out there. Please download it, check it out, use it. Have your developers, if you're not a developer, get into the code because there's a lot of great good practices there. Thanks. So if there are, I'm sorry about that, on time. If there are specific questions, there is a microphone. We ask you to use it. I should also say that there is a survey they're going to ask you to fill out. I can find that. Here's the very quick version of his slides. Yes. And I will also I'm going say, the wrong way. if you don't get a question answered from us, come by the Palantir or Lullabot booth. Dave's at Lullabot. We're at Palantir. We can answer questions there, too. So, but please go ahead. So I just had a quick question. Um, what were your budgetary constraints for this project? Budget, uh, quarter million dollars. It, and it's interesting, the budgetary constraints are the primary reason we went Agile, so that we could make sure that within the budget that they had, we were delivering the highest value. Yes, are there any uh, current policies that this is plugged into, or do you have any goals for having this impact on uh, policies in the various countries? Well, um, the ILT, our organization, is adopted, deems um, Every country is at a different stage in, in terms of data sharing policies and mandates. The U.S., the United States of um, here, has um, very, very generous and very specific mandates about what we should do. In our case, not only we, sh we are sharing all the data and all the metadata, but we comply with, um, with several standards, the ISO 19191.5, and family of ISO standards. The ISO is International Standards Organization, the biological data profile, and the ecological metadata language. Those are all XML expressed. So um, those are constraints that we have, but they are all you know, about sharing, about getting the most to the public and, and the other scientists. 
this varies for scientists, and there are, yes, there are enormous constraints in other countries. It is um, it's, um, a whole ecosystem of, of constraints out there. Yeah. One of the things that the system also does is it, it validates against um, the current EML standards, um, and it, it validates the data just to make sure that it's, it's that. So it's, it, you know, if you have a particular service or a set of standards, uh, it can be built into the, the system, added to the system as a feature to validate, it, validate against those standards. All right, we're at time. I want to thank everyone for coming, and do remember to fill out the survey so that the, the uh, conference organizers can help plan next year's event. Thank you very much. Thank you.